Thank you for choosing to listen to our Faith Family Church podcast. For more information about our church and who we are, you can visit our website at ffcacworth.com. Thank you so much again for listening. We just began a series last week called God on Film. And we're taking some of this year's uh, biggest films in the secular media and we're taking the key messages that they present. And then we're looking at the scripture and saying, what can we gain from that that can also be paralleled with scripture and teach us something about how good God is? And so last week we talked about Beauty and the Beast and Pastor did an amazing job correlating how, how when the Beast was transformed by the love of Bell, in the same way when Jesus encountered us, we became transformed by his love. And I mean, know that that is the essence of what the gospel is, that it was his love that transforms our lives. That it's the passion that Jesus said, the Bible says in Acts, after his passion, he showed himself. After the passion of his love that he gave on the cross, that's when his love transcended time and began to change us into his image. That's when we became Christians and became followers because his love changed our hearts. That that's what last week was. This week, um, we're discussing another uh, movie, and I want, if you have your Bibles, go with me to John chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse 31. This is a very, very uh, popular scripture. Probably a lot of you know it very well, and we're just going to take it and open it up again, and we're going to look into it in a little bit deeper perspective. Oh, God, speak through your word this morning. In John chapter 13, starting in verse 31, this is taking place at the Last Supper. This is Jesus' final night. Uh, before he goes to the cross the next day. And so he's meeting with his disciples one last time to impart his love to them, impart his mission to them and his life to them. And uh, this is where we get the Last Supper, where we take communion from. But Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. All of this is happening that night. And so Jesus has just acknowledged that there's a betrayer in the midst, and Judas has just left the room to go and, and prepare to do what he's going to do later that evening. So Judas is gone. And so Jesus is left with the remaining 11. That's important to note here because Judas did not make it after the crucifixion. Jesus, Judas, if you know the story, he became so remorseful that he betrayed, quote, an innocent man. That's important to realize Judas never acknowledged Jesus as who he really was, which is Lord. Now, Peter did. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Never in Scripture did Judas ever acknowledge Jesus as the Savior and as Lord. So when he came back, he said, I feel so bad because I've just betrayed an innocent man. He didn't say, I've betrayed my Lord. I've betrayed an innocent man. And he went out and he hung himself. So Judas is not part of this meeting. That's important to understand because Jesus is speaking to those who are going to make it. Jesus is speaking to the ones who stay and come back on the day of Pentecost and get filled with the Spirit. He's speaking to the church and to the, and the future church. So that's important to understand. Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since, the son, and since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. So what's Jesus saying? The time has come for me to become what I came here to be, your Savior. The time has come for me to fulfill the mission that the Father has sent me to do, and therefore receive glory from what I'm about to do. Now, in the moment, the cross did not seem very glorious, did it? It seemed almost like a defeat, right, because their leader had just been killed. But how many know if, if, that everything our faith is based on is what Jesus did in those three days? Everything that we believe, uh, the victory we have over sin, the victory we have over sickness, the victory that we have over death, hell, and the grave came through the blood, cross, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the glory that God wanted to come out of that event. And therefore, Jesus said, the time has come for me to be glorified and for the Father to receive the glory from what I'm about to do. Dear children, remember Judas isn't in the room, so dear children, those of you that have chosen to stay, those of you that are with me, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. A lot of people don't say that correctly. Notice the punctuation here. Love each other, period. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. How many of you ever heard it said, love each other just as I have loved you? How many of you ever heard it said like that? But notice there's a period there. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world you are my 
disciples. What a powerful commandment. What a powerful commandment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that it would go forth and not return empty, that, God, it would pierce every heart, that, Lord, we would be changed by what we hear this morning. We would be changed by what you're doing. Lord, we are in awe of you. We're thankful for your presence, God, and I pray, Lord, that as your word goes forth, that, Lord, it would change our hearts in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. So last week, we talked about Beauty and the Beast. Today, June the 9th, we're talking about God on Film, part two, The Fate of the Furious. <laughs> now, once again, as Pastor said last week, we are in no way endorsing go see these movies. We're not endorsing it. But we're, not, we're also not denying that the world has sold millions upon millions upon millions of tickets and dollars for other people that have gone to see these movies. And so we're trying to not just connect with the world around us, but we're also trying to understand that if someone brings up and says, man, I saw that movie, The Fate of the Furious, that was an awesome movie. Because you're in this series right now, you can say, yeah, that's the movie that has this message. Let me tell you about what God says you can do with that same message. That's why we're doing this. Because we want, you to be, we want you to have another tool in your arsenal that you can go, and when someone brings up, man, that movie was great, you can go, yeah, that movie was great. Now let me tell you what the Bible says about the same thing that movie told you. And you can use it as a witnessing tool. Now let me tell you a little bit about The Fate of the Furious. I've only seen the first one and the sixth one. This is number eight, I believe. But the, the whole purpose of the, of the series is there's a lot of action, there's a lot of cars, a lot of planes, a lot of explosions. It's a guy movie. It's a guy movie, unless some of you women might be into that kind of stuff. But it's very much a guy movie. And again, I've only seen the first one and the sixth one. I'm not big into cars. Uh, those of you that are, I apologize. I don't, you don't want me looking under the hood of your car because I don't know what I'm looking at. Um, and I'm not really into, um, you know, a lot of crazy acrobatic stuff. I'm more into, um, you know, action drama. I'm a big superhero guy. I love, uh, like, the Avengers and Justice League's coming out in a few months, and I can't wait to see it. All that kind of stuff, that's where I'm more at. And I'm, and I'm more drama and, and uh, suspenseful stuff. I like that kind of stuff. But I understand the series because I've seen a, a little bit of it, and I know a little bit about it. And when I was reading the notes for this message and really praying and asking God to show me what to speak about this, um, it really became apparent to me what, uh, what to do. Uh, the lead actor in all the series, his name is Vin Diesel. Here's what he says. Everyone's looking for the thrill, but the only thing that is real is family. Everyone's looking for the thrill, but the only thing that's real is family. Now, this is a secular, non-born-again uh, person saying this. And it goes on to say, when our series actor, Paul Walker, died, the cast said, we've lost part of the family. We've lost part of the family. If you don't know, Paul Walker was the second main actor from the first movie all the way to movie number seven. He died tragically, believe it or not, in a car accident going 100 miles an hour. So in other words, he got off the set and kept doing it. He got off the set and he kept driving fast cars and he kept doing crazy stunts. And one night he did it one too many and it cost him his life. And the, and the whole cast came to his funeral and they all said, we've lost a member of the family. You see... What's unique about this series is the same cast stays together for years. They don't turn over new characters. In other words, somebody doesn't say, I'm not coming back for number five. Get somebody else to play my part. They keep coming back. They keep coming back to do it. This is like, I think, if I'm not mistaken, movie number eight. Eight movies, the same people playing the same characters. They keep coming back, not because of the character, not because of the stunts, not because of the movie, because of the family that they form together. English actress Helen Mirren, some of y'all might know her, she said, they look like they're having so much fun together, I want to be a part of that family. I want to be in the next movie. Whether I'm a good guy, bad guy, I don't care. I just want to be with the family. I want to join up. I want to, I want to come to rehearsals. I want to learn the lines with them. I want to hang out with them and go to eat with them and spend time at their homes. These people spend Christmases together. They spend holidays and birthdays together. They don't just come together to film and then go their separate ways. They do life together because they become a family. The films all follow the same pattern. The people who start out as the enemy, by the end of the movie, they join and become part of the family. In the very first movie, which I did see, Paul Walker plays a cop who goes undercover to bust this motor, cr this motor crew. They're stealing cars and stealing parts and stealing drugs, and he goes undercover to catch them, 
in the process of going undercover, he realizes they're not doing it for money. They're doing it to protect each other because they're family. And they're doing it to protect each other from rival gangs and from other uh, people that are trying to hurt them. And so they do it to get each other out of trouble. And Paul Walker becomes best friends with Vin Diesel's character, and they become like brothers. And by the end of the movie, they're protecting each other, and he literally tells the police force they're not, they're not breaking the law for the wrong reason. They're doing it to protect each other. And, and all, every single movie after that, there's a person in the movie who wants to get them in trouble or hurt them, and then by the end of the movie, they're so enamored with the family, they say, I want to be with you. I want to join you. And every movie, it's the same pattern. A policeman or a rival leader or a, a, a person from over the seas who's trying to compete with them or whatever. By the end of the movie, they're one of them. Every single movie, the family grows with more people. And every time they lose someone, everybody feels the loss because they become more than a gang. They become more than a crew. They become a family. I hope you all see where I'm going with this. God created community. God created the need for us to be with each other. If you remember in the very first ch chapter of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, when God created Adam and Eve, he did it for this purpose, relationship. God didn't create Adam and Eve to just create another creation. He created a creation called man that he could fellowship with one-on-one, -on -one, that he could talk to, and that they, we could talk back to him. He created us for relationship with him. In the same way, God also then said, very next verse, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, showing that God also intended for people to have community with each other as family. So in other words, God has a true heart for family. God has a true heart for community. God has a true heart for, not, for us not being isolated to each other. One of our key core values at this church is connect. Because we believe it's so important that not only do we connect with God, we connect with each other as family. And the reason we connect with each other as family is because when we do so, we are reflecting the very image of our God. Because God himself is a three-in-one family. Remember? It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God himself is a community. Out of his community, he created a community out of himself he created a family to fellowship with us it's so important we remember that we're supposed to be family that we're supposed to have love for each other as a family but not only does God desire community people desire community people do not want to be islands to themselves people do not want to be isolated there's a deep down part of each one of us that wants to connect with someone else. In the Huffington Post, I read this article. It says 23% of the U.S. population and 35% of the millennials, which is 40 and under, born in 1980 and on, they consider themselves nuns, N-O-N-E-S, or religiously unaffiliated, making them the second largest faith-related group in the USA. The largest is still Christianity, but we're shrinking. We've got to get, we've got to get, we've got to, get to work. 23% of the U.S. population, 35% of those born from 1980 to today, call themselves religiously unaffiliated or nuns, which means they don't know what they believe, or they don't believe in necessarily anything. In other words, they live moment to moment, day to day, based on what they think is right for that moment. They don't have a standard that they live by. They don't have a core value they live by. They don't have a calling they live by or a, or a really religious institution they live by. They just live moment to moment, day to day, moment, unaffiliated with any religion necessarily. They're nuns. Nuns are building communities in myriad ways. Meditation groups, church-like Sunday assemblies, they're finding ways to connect. So in other words, they're trying to establish connection with each other even though they're not necessarily affiliated with anything because they have a deep down urge, I want to connect with someone. I want to build a relationship with someone. I want to find someone I have something in common with. I want to find, some, I want to find someone that, 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 that you know, wants to do life with me, wants to you know, help me you know, in my day-to-day -day life. I want, I want to talk to someone about my job. I want to talk to someone about my family. I want to talk to someone and let our kids play together. I want a community with people. I don't want to be alone. If I'm alone, I can't, do mo I can't do anything more than I already am. 
But if I'm with you, two becomes one. We become stronger. A three-braided cord is not easily broken. The stronger the cable, the more power I have. The more I connect with people, the stronger I am. I want to be a part of a community. But they don't want to be a part of a religious community. They want to associate with people on surface-level things. But they want to connect nonetheless. Now, why is that? Why are people not wanting to connect through the church? Why are people not wanting to have a religious affiliation? Why are people turning away from the church and wanting to just connect outside the church in these none communities? Read this. Many people who leave religious institutions do so because they feel these institutions are no longer inspiring moral action or because they disagree with the fundamental moral tenets of the faith. The second part we can't do much about. We believe in the Bible. We believe in God. We believe in what God stands for. We believe in His Word. His Word is irrefutable. His Word is unchangeable. His Word has no error. His Word you can live your life on. His Word will save you. His Word will promise you a place in heaven. You live by His Word. You die by His Word. We believe that. We are followers of Christ. And that means the word that Christ spoke is the word that changed our lives, and it's all based on relationship with him. Because again, let me stress this. God created community and family in Genesis chapter 1. God didn't create the church till Acts chapter 2. Let that sink in for a second. God created family and community in Genesis 1. God didn't create an institution until Acts chapter 2. Because God's heart far exceeds more for community and family than he does for an institution. The problem is the church has become, for the most part, an institution and has stopped being a family. And that's why they're leaving. Not because they disagree with our tenants. That's a big reason. If there are people that believe differently than you do, you can't change them. Only the Holy Spirit can. All you can do is pray for them and live a life in front of them that is godly and pray that God will give you an open door to help lead them to Christ. That's the best you can do for those people. But it's the previous statement that that really troubled me. The church no longer inspires moral action. That's scary. The church no longer inspires goodness, no longer inspires hope, no longer inspires faith, no longer inspires love, and no longer inspires moral action. So they leave. If we're not inspiring, what are we doing? Deterring, pushing away, stiff arming, instead of, hey, you may not agree with this, but we want you to be family. You may not be where we are spiritually yet, but we want you, we want to receive you and help you get there. You may not firmly believe everything we believe, but we want to show you why we believe it and love you in spite of that until you come around. We want to be family. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? The culture of this world is therefore attempting to create a sense of community among people without them having to belong to accountability. This is the heart of it. This is what Satan is up to. He is trying to create a sense of community among lost people that has no standards or has no accountability. Therefore, they have a community, but they have nothing holding them to accountability. They have nothing holding them to goodness, nothing holding them to what's right and what's wrong. Therefore, what they do is they just have a community of we do what feels good. We do what sounds good. We do what we think should be done in this moment. And we don't base it on the word or base it on God or base it on even right versus wrong. We do it based on feeling and based on thoughts and based on ideas. And how many know that's dangerous? That's dangerous. And it's crept into the Congress. It's crept into the Supreme Court. It's crept into large institutions. And brothers and sisters, I hate to tell you this, it's creeping into the church. It's creeping into the church because people have decided we're going to trade being a family for being popular. We're going to trade being a family for being relevant. We're going to trade being a family for being current. We're going to trade being a family for being accessible. But God did not create the church to be relevant, current, or accessible. He created the church to be a family. And when you become a part of the family, it's so important to realize and understand that when you become a part of the family, you get the heart of God. When you become part of the family, you become part of who God is. 
You become part of God's very DNA because God created us to be family. Well, if this is the issue, then what can be done? Here's what can be done. If the church is going to impact and change the culture, we must love. We must love. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must love one another. The word love in this scripture is the Greek word agape, which means unconditional love of God. Unconditional. What does that mean? You can't change it. It has no circumstances. It has no limitations. It has no conditions. It's unconditional. Agape love. Jesus said, with that same love that I've given to you, hey, boys, y'all were uneducated, fishermen, tax collectors, sinners. And I didn't look at you and go, I can't love you. I still chose you anyway. I still called you to follow me. I still made you part of my family. And I loved you until you got it. I loved you and I put up with your mistakes and I put up with your shortcomings and I put up with your secular smell and your secular verbenology and your secular talk and your secular ways. I put up with that and loved you and loved you and loved you until you came to this point in your life where you get it and you've chosen to follow me. In that same way, go now and love others. They're not going to get it the first time you talk about me. They're not going to get it the first time you do something different than they do. They're not going to get it the first time you do something godly instead of something sinful. They're not going to get it the first time you speak this to them. But if you continue to love them unconditionally, my love will eventually get through to them, and they will come and want to say, I want to join the family. Love one another just as I have loved you you should love one another because the agape love of God can break through any cultural barrier, any racial prejudice, and overcome any obstacle. I've seen it over and over and over. You can be the worst crack dealer in the, wor in the whole city. His love will break through to you. You can be the worst sinner this world has ever seen. His love will break through to you. I don't, care how drunk, I don't care how drunk you've been. I don't care how high you've been. I don't care how many people you've been with. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. I don't care how greedy you've been, how prejudiced you've been. God's love will break you down. It will break you down. I'm a product of it because you know what his love broke in me? The worst obstacle of all, religion. And man, his love shattered that. Because religion is what turns people away from the church. Because religion is institution. Religion is jail. Religion is rules and regulations. Religion is you can do this, you can't do that. Relationship is, I love you so much, Lord, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. Amen. Those of you that are married, you don't keep your wife happy because you are just afraid. <laughs> I hope you don't keep your wife happy or your husband happy because you're afraid. That's what religion is. It's based on fear. Religion's based on this notion that God is so holy and so righteous and so awesome that he's untouchable. That if you don't do the way, if you don't do everything God does, oh, I see that. That's not how he speaks because he's a father and he wants family. I discipline my children in love. And my children do have a holy fear of me because I'm their daddy. But my children know the same hand that corrects them and the same voice that corrects them is the same voice that tells them all day, every day, I love you, princess. I love you, Nader Tater. That's our nickname for him. Because I'm a father. And how much more does Abba Father want family? How much more does he want people to know the agape love that he has for them? That it doesn't matter what they've done, what they're doing, or even what they will do. His love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's waiting right there for them. If they would just choose to believe it and accept it and call upon it, that it will break them down, break the chains, break the bondages, break the pressure, eliminate the prejudice, overcome the obstacles, bring them in and call them son or daughter. But we become so saturated as an institution 
and we've stopped being family. And that's why they're leaving. And that's why they're not coming through the doors as they should. But I promise you, when they need family, the first place they should turn to is the church. It should be the first place. Your love will prove to the world you're my disciples. Please read that again. Your love will prove to the world you are my disciples. Not Buddhas, not Muhammad, not pantheism, not atheism, not secularism, not humanism. You know how they're going to know you belong to me? Your love. Because you can't deny that. You can't deny love. You can't deny that there's something real about the way he treats him. There's something real about the way she treats her. There's something real about the fact that they are, they are so of such a family that they can raise kids together, they can love each other. When they make mistakes, they forgive each other. Oh, boy. When they hurt each other, they say, it's okay, let's get past this. I don't want a fence to grow between us. When there's a problem, they deal with it one-on-one, -on -one, like the Bible says in Matthew 18 to do. If you have a problem with your brother, go to them one-on-one. -on -one. Don't go talk to the pastor about them. Go to them one-on-one -on -one and deal with it. They have love. They want to be family. They want to have a community that is built on love and built on the word of God that the Bible says the gates of hell cannot shake. So how come the world doesn't see that we're his disciples? Could it be we've lost the love? Could it be that our love has become conditional? There's a second word that Jesus used for the word love called phileo which means brotherly love. Brotherly love means I love you as a brother, I love you as a sister, but that's a conditional love because eventually if you do enough wrong things to someone, you say you're no longer family. You're out, son. You're out, girl. Get to stepping. You crossed the line too many times. You hurt us too much. You've broken us too much. You've offended me too much. You took my spot in the pew. Get to stepping. But the agape love says, though you sin against me seven times, I forgive you 70 times seven. The agape love says, I don't care what you've done to me, I still love you. We're going to get past this. It may take you longer than me, but we're going to get past this. It may come around in 10 years, but we're going to get past this. And I'm not going to stop loving you. I'm not going to stop praying for you. I'm not going to stop speaking good about you. I'm not going to stop helping you in any way I can help you because we're family. And you don't forsake family. Blood is thicker than water, and we are bought with the best blood ever, the blood of Christ. So we are not going to forsake you. We're not going to turn you away. You're going to become part of this family. Amen. Dear friends, let us love one another. This is written by John, who was in that room, by the way. Love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God. There's that word, child. He got it. Anyone who loves is a family member. He's part of the family. He's a child of God, and he knows God. He knows the Father. He doesn't know the perception of God. He doesn't know what the world says God is. He knows God. He knows the Father. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is agape. God is unconditional. You can't put conditions on God. You can't limit God. You can't put God in a box. He's God. He's agape. If you don't love, you don't know him. That's scary. And then Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Not secondary, equally important. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The entire law and demands of the prophets can be based on these two commandments. What is Jesus saying? The institutionalized part of religion, you'll take care of it when you love. The churchy part of church, don't do this, don't do that, dress like this, dress like that, show this, show that, be this, be that, all that stuff, it gets taken care of when you love. Because when you love God, you don't want to hurt God. When you love God, you don't want to offend God. 
When you love God, you don't want to bring God grief. When you love God, you don't want to misrepresent him. When you love God, you don't want to speak ill of him. When you love God, you won't use his name in vain. When you love God, you won't speak ill of him to other people. When you love God, you won't say, I can't believe God's letting me go through this. When you love God, you won't complain. When you love God, you won't be bitter. When you love God, you won't have an offense in your heart. When you love God, your relationship with God dictates what you do. But the second is equal unto it. If you love God, you have to love each other. Because God loves them the same way he loves you. And God died for them the same way he died for you. And God's grace for them is the same grace as it is for you. And God's mercy on them is the same mercy he showed you. One of the most horrific parts of the Bible to me, because it scares me, is when people come to the end and they say, Lord, did we not do all these great things? And he says, I don't know you. Because while everybody else was out showing love, I didn't see love in your heart. And I am love. And if you don't know love, you don't know me. Church, our core values, worship, connect, grow, serve, and go. Our vision, grow in faith, grow with family, grow his church. You know how you can accomplish every single one of those things? Love God and love people. Love God and love people. Could it be more simple than that? But not with a phileo love that's conditional. With an agape love. With a love that reaches beyond any circumstance and reaches beyond any obstacle. My brothers and sisters, this is a hard message for me. Because in my own heart, I was convicted as I was preparing this message. That there are people in my own circle that even live next door to me that I wonder if they know that I have a love for God and I have a love for them. And if I asked them to come to church with me, I wonder if they would say yes. Because am I modeling in my own heart an agape love for God and an agape love for people? If this church is ever going to fulfill its destiny and fulfill what God has called it to be, if we're ever going to show worship, connect, grow, serve, and go, if we're ever going to grow as a church in faith and family and in church, if we're ever going to accomplish our mission of making disciples through irrefutable lifestyles and influential acts of service, we can't do it without His love. The world has already said, I've tried the church. I didn't find love there. They didn't want me to be a part of their family because I dress differently or I talk differently or I have a different background than they do, or I may not even look like them. And so I came in, sat on a pew, nobody greeted me, nobody loved me, nobody tried to connect with me. And if I want to connect with people, I'll just go find people that are like me. I'll go find people that have the same baggage I do. I'll go find people that have the same struggles I do. I'll go find people that don't, that don't condemn me for what I do, or don't try to change me. I'll go join a community of nuns. And we'll have a community together. That's what we've become. That's what this church has become. And I don't mean this church faith family. I mean the church worldwide. The church worldwide has got to wake up because the Bible says in the last days, he's coming back for a pure, spotless bride. He's coming back for a bride that is full of love for the groom and full of love for the family. We have a calling this morning, an order, a commandment from Jesus. Just as I have loved you, love one another. He did not mean love others outside the family. He said, first, you got to get your love with each other. The disciples were different too. Some were from Galilee, some were from Judea, some had accents, some were different races, some had different backgrounds, some had more baggage than others. And Jesus said, boys, you can't love the world until you learn how to love each other. If you can't love each other under the covering of my blood and my name, how are you going to love someone outside of us? We have to get, we have to get in our mind, we've got to learn how to love each other. Jesus said, if you have aught with your brother, leave your offering here, go make it right, then come back and worship. Because Jesus values the family more than an offering. Jesus values your relationship with your brother and sister on the same pew as you more than how much you give, more than how much you worship, no more than how much you read your word, more than even how much you pray. Jesus values your relationship with his family 
more than what you do and don't do. It is so imperative that as we go forward, we need to have such a relationship with each other, such a connection with each other, such a community with each other, that when people talk about this church, that's a loving place. That's a place you can't miss. That's a place you got to go check out. That's a church you want to be a part of. That's a church that everybody in there loves each other. No one talks bad about each other. No one talks about the pastor. No one talks about the music. No one talks about this, this time frame. No one talks about the meetings. No one talks about anything. They just love each other. They love being together. They hang out. They go eat afterward. They join connect groups. They talk to each other. They don't stop talking about their church. This person in the cubicle next to me, she won't shut up about Faith Family Church. They love their church. They love their God. They love each other. Wouldn't you want to join that? Wouldn't you want to be a part of that? That's why I did. That's why God brought me here. Because this church can be that church. This church is a loving church. This church is an awesome church. I'm so grateful and humbled that when I got here to interview, I was embraced with love. I was embraced with, with, with grace, with people that smiled and hugged me and said, we're so glad you came to see us. Even if we never see you again, Pastor David, we're so glad you came. That's love. But church, it, can, it shouldn't be the best kept secret. The love we have for each other here should not be a secret. This community should be buzzing about the love that's in this house. This community should be buzzing about the love that comes from this pulpit about the love that comes from our songs, about the love that comes from our connect groups, about the love that comes from our discipleship, about the love that comes from our outreach. We should saturate every part of who we are with His love. Because when you love God and you love people, you reflect who God is. And God changes people. God changes hearts. God changes lives. Please bow your heads and close your eyes with me. This is an open invitation. And I'm going to be in the altar with you. I'm going to challenge every single person in this room to do an evaluation of yourself and say, you know what, God? There may be a part of me. I still may have some issues with maybe a brother in the church or a sister in the church. They did something to me. I got offended. I need to deal with that. And before I go deal with that, God, I, wanna, I want you to give me strength and grace to do so. Or you may be here and say, you know what? I think I'm okay with my brothers and sisters in the church, but there's a part of me that needs to be fixed when it comes to loving people outside this family. You know what, Pastor David and God? I can honestly say that I don't have a really big influence outside my church. A lot of people don't know about the church I go to. They don't hear me talking about it. They don't hear the love I have for my brothers and sisters. They don't hear the love I have for you. And your greatest commandment is to love you and then love others. And I need you, God, I need you to reinvigorate my love. Re-energize it. Re re refuel it, God. New infilling of your spirit. New infilling of your love so that I can turn and show it to you and show it to others. In category three. God, I'm working on my love for you, and I'm working on my love for others. But I know I can do more. I know I can get involved in some way. I know I can speak more. I know I can love more. I know I can connect more. I know I can do more because I want this church to be the beacon of love that you want it to be. I want this church to be the house of love that it needs to be. I want this church to be everything it's destined to be. God, I can do more. I can do more. I'm not talking about making a huge banner and waving it every time you get in your car. I'm not talking about covering your car in church stickers. I'm not talking about passing out tracks every single person you meet. Those are all great things. But I'm talking about your everyday life, your words, your thoughts, your actions exude His love. Every person you meet, they feel the love. Every person you shake their hand, they feel the love. Every cash girl at Walmart, every person next to you in, at work, every, every member of your family, every friend you have, your next door neighbors, they feel the love. That's what opens the door. That's what opens the door and gives you a chance to witness and gives you a chance to invite them to church. And you say, you know what? I can do more. If you're in any of those three categories, and if, believe it or not, I think just about all of us should be, 
If you're in any of those three categories, I'm just going to invite you. Let's just spend the moment with God. Let's just get out of our seats. Let's just approach this altar. And let's just say, God, fill us with your love. Fill us with your love for each other. Fill us with your love for this world. And help us to grow this church into a church of love. So if that's you and any of those three things, you're like, Pastor David, I'm with you. Please get up out of your seats and join me at this altar. We're going to pray. We're just going to ask God to fill us with his love. We're going to be here. If you need to leave, you feel free to leave. I'll dismiss in prayer in just a little while. We're going to spend some time in prayer. We're going to spend some time loving God and asking God to help us love others. And in doing this, we're going to fulfill the great commandments. And we're going to be the church Jesus has called us to be. We're going to reflect his image. We're going to move in his love. We're going to show his love. We're going to change hearts with his love. We're going to have signs and wonders follow us because the love of God is what births those things. If you're cut to the heart and say, you know what, God, help me to love you. Help me to love others. Help me to put aside the things that are stopping that love, that are hindering that love. Whatever those things may be, I pray if God brings anything to your heart and says, I want you to deal with this, leave it at this altar. Do not pick it up and take it with you. Leave it here. Leave it right here. And say, God, from this day forward, I'm going to love you and I'm going to love others. Leave the offense at the altar. Leave the hindrances at the altar. Leave the pain at the altar. Leave the bad memories at the altar. Leave them all here. For where this church is going, we can't take anything with us except his love. And if you don't feel led to get up and come to the front, that's fine. Please, where you are in your seat, bow your head, close your eyes, and just, just pray with him. Just, just speak to God. Just love God and say, God, help me love others. And help me to build a church that loves others. You build the church, God, and I'm part of it. Help me to love others. And help me to love others regardless of race, background, culture, decisions they make, the way they talk, the way they dress. No matter what that person appeals to me, you die for them too. You love them just as much as you love me. I used to be that person, God. I was lost. I didn't know who you were. I didn't dress like I do now. I didn't look like I do now. I didn't talk like I do now. But that's why you changed me. And I want them to experience the same love change that I did. And that's going to take me showing the same love that somebody else showed me. Lord, let your house be a house of love. Let your people be a people of love. For you, God, are agape love thank you Jesus again you can feel free to join us at this altar or you can pray in your pew it does not matter be dismissed if you want to leave if you need to leave I understand we understand well thank you so much God